All right, thanks everybody. Uh, here to talk about energy, which is uh, rather timely. A couple days ago, uh, if you've been following the news, you guys are the news. Uh, Janesville, Minnesota, they were notified about uh, rationing of, uh, of energy. And you know, that just doesn't seem like, it's kind of unbelievable that that would happen here in Minnesota. You know, that seems like a, seems like a California thing. And, uh, and this, is, this is in the summer. You know, um, what happens if what happens if this is in the winter, you know, literally, um, literally a matter of, of life and death. And, you know, just high, high level. Very, <laughs> very good. Max. Thank you. Energy. We like energy. Very good. We like that. Um, that we're having a rolling blackout here at the Capitol. Oh, good job. Um, you know, just real high level, we talk about energy, you know, uh, vitally important for a lot of reasons. But, you know, the thing I guess is a little bit off putting to me is the conversation has kind of been hijacked, if you will, by, uh, I'd say, extreme environmentalists. Uh, we've been kind of fossil fuels have been vilified. Uh, you know, fossil fuels is, is the reason why, as a globe, we're able to feed eight billion people. Um, and, uh, you know, while it's certainly those are not perfect uh, and, and there has been a lot of advancements being made in uh, how, we, uh, how, we, how we get those and, and, and with the byproducts and, and that, it's, uh, it's still by far the most reliable and cost effective source of energy we have. It's, it's, they, they're an essential part of the equation of the energy equation today. Uh, and it's also been, you know, oversold the uh, efficacy of renewables, particularly solar and wind. Um, and so, you know, I, again, it's kind of one of those things. I don't understand why, why it is a, why is it a partisan issue? But energy stability is uh, is crucial to, uh, to 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 our way of life. And. Um, it's concerning that uh, some of these extreme green policies that we see in our government and some of the extreme green policies that I think are being brought to Minnesota by Tim Walls and Peggy Flanagan uh, already putting us in a tight spot and, uh, and, 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 and are really going to lead us to a, to a death spiral. And um, so as Scott and I approached this plan, it was not about consulting Republican consultants uh, about about how to do this but it was really about let's let, let's figure out what actually what the truth is you know it's always good to start with with what the truth is try to figure out what the truth is uh, and, and 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 get the facts and uh, and work from there and uh, fossil fuel is a big part of that equation as well as uh, going forward allowing the private sector to invest and develop in uh, in greener uh, renewable new new forms of, of energy uh, and um, you know, the other thing, too, is, as we just heard today from President Biden, that he said uh, inflation numbers, half of it was due to energy costs. So I think uh, I think most citizens are are concerned with that as well. So with that, I'll turn it over to Scott. Appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, everybody, for coming. Let's just jump straight in. What we've said since the beginning of our campaign is that we want to be a campaign where we're going to push and talk about the big ideas and what we can do. And yet we want these ideas to be they have to be actionable. So we're gonna have some short-term goals, we're gonna have some long-term goals. But I think it's appropriate for us to ask ourselves, what do other people rely on for the functioning of their activities of daily life that we might not in regards to energy? And this morning when I was seeing a patient, she requires without question a steady supply of oxygen. She's now saying, well, can I get a, a battery-operated tank as well as my plug-in? She stays home pretty much all the time. But folks are fearful, and they're saying, do I need to try to go get a generator? I think there's, there's so much happening, and Matt mentioned this death spiral. We're seeing leaders in our country with clear misconceptions about what happens with energy. A couple of months ago, we had Elizabeth, Senator Elizabeth Warren talking about she wanted one of the largest exporters of liquid uh, gas, liquid natural gas, she wanted them to reduce their exports. She said that will lower the prices for people in the United States. But it wasn't true at all, because the pipelines leading from that company to the northeastern part of the country where they needed it, those are full. 
and there were no more pipelines to use. So if you ask a company, I think it was EQT, if you, and it was uh, Toby Rice, I think is the CEO, if you ask him to reduce his exports, you're simply reducing, in that situation, 22% of the world's available liquid natural gas. So arguably what you're doing is you're increasing the price for people in the northeastern part of this, the country because they would have to then vie against Canada and other nations who would all of a sudden be short 22%. And then we have someone like Biden come on and say that he wants half the cars in 2030 to be all EV. Well, 90% of the supply chain necessary to have that fleet of electric vehicles in place, 90% of that supply chain, whether you're talking about batteries, charging stations, all, doesn't even exist. So it, it seems preposterous that we would do this to ourselves. I think an awful lot of people that Matt and I are running into every day is people asking, it seems like government is literally creating its own crises. We're putting, we're creating our own bottlenecks. So here's what we think we need to do to have that robust conversation that gives us actionable items so we can move forward. First, we need to lift the moratorium on the ability to build any additional nuclear plants. Unfortunately, we're sort of stuck. We're stuck thinking about nuclear power in the Chernobyl days. Things have changed so dramatically. When you start talking about small modular reactors, you talk about cell nuclear uh, capabilities, we have the ability. Granted, they're still all fission-based. We're moving close to fusion. Clearly, hydrogen is going to be the, the uh, energy source that we want to all use within the next 50 to 100 years. But for now, we can't let our wants undercut and neuter our economy because that's what we're doing. So we need to lift the moratorium. We need to suspend and repeal the California-based car mandates. A lot of people don't realize we had a choice, federal or California. If we follow California, it had to be pretty much to the letter of the law. So I believe it was in 2019 that Governor Walsh used an administrative rule to move in that direction. And then two years later in the summer, he uh, signed off on the rulemaking. So here we sit. Now, California, since then, has modified their rules. They've accelerated what they want to see happen, such that they want 35% of all vehicles sold by 2025 to be electric vehicles. That's huge, considering that right now we don't get to 3%. So we don't get to 3%, but we got to get to 35% by 2025 if Minnesota is going to continue to follow the California car mandates. There is no logic in this. We are not California. They have a different situation. Sometimes it just drives me crazy that I think people seem to think that above Minnesota, we have our own little atmospheric chunk, and that if we preserve that, we've done the right thing. But you know as well as I do that there's an admixture that goes on literally within hours. So if other states aren't doing what we're doing and we're doing this and we're undercutting our very throat, then we're not doing something as wise. We need to issue an executive order to deed to cooperate with private sector energy pro providers to identify regulations, permits, and licenses. We are literally permitting ourselves to death in this state. We are taking innovative entrepreneurial businesses sometimes a public-private sector combination, and we're saying, we're gonna make it as difficult as possible for you. We've gotta stop that. We need to order a Department of Commerce assessment and de determination of retiring baseload power sources in Minnesota. I'm sure you're all aware of the fact that right now, we've got baseload power plants scheduled to go offline, and it's in the midst of great need. I would have thought that what happened in Texas to the grid three years ago, when people literally died and froze to death, would have been enough of a wake-up call for us that everybody on both sides of the aisle would say, my stars, we really need to have that big, robust conversation. How do we deal with this in a nonpartisan fashion? We need to tap the Renewable Development Fund for projects to create Minnesota-based energy sources. These are not part of the overpayment, the 12 billion, the 10 billion, wherever it lands. This is a separate fund. It's got 50 to 100 million dollars in it. This is something we can use that we could start saying, let's fuel, pun intended, let's fuel some original innovative thinking. That's what we need to do. We need to finish the hydro turbine in Granite Falls. And we need to investigate further clean hydro uh, possibilities in Minnesota. We need to look at advanced energy storage. As I mentioned, hydrogen, ammonia, this is going to be part of our future. We need to modernize our grid, and we need to be able to, if you will, work with MySO so that it works well and that we have 
the ability to preserve for all people, those on oxygen, those needing air conditioning, nursing homes that need, if you will, a vital source of energy that doesn't get interrupted, especially those nursing homes that may not have generator backup. We need those public-private partnerships, as I mentioned, to find additional energy sources. There's no reason why we can't continue to develop wind and solar more effectively, but there's no reason also why we're not looking at wood pellet energy and other sources also. And lastly, once we've used some of those RDF dollars to get innovation moving, we need to take some of the excess and put it in rebates and credits so that Minnesotans are paying less for their energy bills. Those are the 10 points. You can see that some of them we can do right away. We can absolutely get rid of the moratorium. We can absolutely start using the RDF funds to start innovation. We can absolutely move forward and finish up the Granite Falls event, uh, that project. And we can suspend and, and repeal the new California-based car mandates. We need to have that big conversation, and that's why Matt and I are in front of you. We said over and over again, we want to talk about the issues, whether the issue is inflation, whether the issue is public safety, whether it's energy. Mark my words, we'll be coming to you talking about education. We're going to be talking about the impact on ag. There are so many things, and I think Minnesotans are tired of the politics as usual. They just want to have a conversation. So I know that uh, Governor Walls and I are going to have a conversation at Farm Fest. I think we're going to have a conversation on Almanac a week or two later. We're going to have a conversation at Game Fair. I would think that as journalists, you, this is just so critically important to you. This is what you do is uh, you find out what are we thinking, what is Governor Walls thinking, and then you go dig. And you say, okay, does this make sense or was this just a pile of beans? And I think we, we need to work together. And there's no reason uh, why you can't help foster and fuel this conversation going forward. Having said that, I wouldn't want to just make one other comment about the California car mandates. Right now, and I think this matters a lot, if you look at, I think it's the only pickup that's classified as an electric vehicle right now, and it's called the Lightning. And if you look at that, in a Minnesota January day, that vehicle has less than a 200 mile range, and it shrinks if you're towing anything. Minnesotans need to know that. My son-in-law owns a, a pickup, and he can move 500 miles as a range. He's gonna to be told at some point in time that when he buys his next pickup, that he doesn't get to have a 500 mile range. He's gotta settle for less than 200 miles. I think Minnesotans are gonna say that's not acceptable. We're not saying that we have all the right answers, but we are saying how in the world can we get to where we've gotta be if we don't have these conversations? So we've got our 10 point plan. I think Matt might wanna add a few comments onto mine and then sure. we'll open up for questions. Thanks Matt. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Well, I too own a pickup. You? Okay, so yeah. I thought that was your wife's. No, that's oh, mine. Uh, I want to pick up for 24 years. So let me speak to the pickup thing. Okay, thanks. Um, I'd say this too. You know, and again, this is, uh, uh, again, I don't know why it's partisan. Uh, you know, I consider myself an environmentalist. Uh, I think there's a green idealism in, in, in everybody. You know, we would love to believe that we could be 100% solar. Like, but that's just not, that's just not reality uh, today. And so... Um, you know, like Scott says, we want to have these conversations. We think that these things are, are, are realistic. Um, now, of course, you know, some, there are opportunistic politicians out there who will, who will, uh, you know, cast that, uh, cast us in the shadow of, you know, not caring about the environment, you know, and, 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 and all that. And I just, I don't think, uh, I don't think that's right because like I said, this isn't just, it's not just energy, um, you know, not just turn our lights on, which is great, but uh, people rely on energy to live. Uh, one one, one uh, example Scott did mention was, you know, livestock, right? In the summer, if you go through a ro rolling blackout uh, and you don't have air conditioning for your livestock, they die. Um, and so uh, we, want, we want to bring realistic solutions that we can live with now, um, but also uh, I think where this, where this whole environmental conversation needs to go is actually on, on, on how can we decrease consumption? And, and I don't know if that's the, if that's the government's role or not, but um, it's, it's, something to, it's something to consider here in America where we are, we are, the, uh, we are the number one consumers of just about everything uh, in this world. And uh, I'll just share a little personal story, Scott. 90 days every winter, I take cold showers for 90 days. Uh, I don't just do it for environmental purposes, but, uh, but, that's, but, uh, but that's part of it. 
and uh, you know things, uh, things like that. Um, I can remember when I was a kid, you know, collecting cans and, and doing the recycle. Like it was, it was a thing. Uh, recycling and, and turning off lights and, and those types of things. And I really think where it, it behooves everybody, and I think that everybody can get behind uh, a conversation on decreasing uh, consumption where, uh, where where possible. Uh, I think uh, I think that's all I had. Okay. Any questions? Dr. Jensen, the uh, pink car standards, I think those rules were adopted that are due to take effect in 2024 for modeling year 2025. Is there something that you're proposing to stop that? Can, how, how do you stop that from taking effect? My understanding is the, the most efficient and rapid way to do that is legislatively. To do it within a countering administrative rule followed up by rulemaking, it's difficult to compress that into less than 12 months. So I think, I'm, I'm not certain, Brian, you may well be right. I thought that we had 2023 to prepare for 24, which had to be 7%. And then in 25, we had hit 35%. But I could be wrong on those numbers. But regardless, um, when Matt and I get elected in November, we plan in January on asking the legislature to go ahead and put together the necessary legislation and get it to our desk so that we can indeed abandon the California car mandates and move in the other direction because, as you know, we had a choice in Minnesota. And that was never decided by the people. It wasn't decided by the legislature. I know that we've heard Governor Wall say, well, the legislature wouldn't take it up. Governor Walls knows as well as anybody that he had a Democratic House and a Republican Senate, and they couldn't get that done. So I don't think we have to you know, piddle around on that kind of an argument. Um, you guys offer some nuanced views on, on some of these uh, energy policy. There's a lot of good arguments made that energy policy and climate policy are tied together. Absolutely. I didn't hear a whole lot of discussion about climate. I haven't heard you talk a lot about climate. Can you give us your general views on climate change and the health of the climate and then how it informs or works within this plan? The problem with talking about climate is the word is such a lightning rod. I mean, we all know that. So it, it basically devolves from a conversation and a brainstorming session into virtually a religious discussion. So I'm plenty willing to talk about a green movement. How can we preserve our environment, our water, our atmosphere? But as soon as we say climate, everybody goes ballistic. And it's... It's no different than with COVID. I mean, you say certain buzzwords in COVID, you have a good chance of either being canceled or shadow boxed or whatever you call it. So we're staying away from those. So that's why you haven't heard us talk about that, David. But I think Matt did just speak to it. Why in the world is taking care of the space in which we live so partisan? We all want this. We'd love it if wind and solar could handle our needs and we'd have, we, we could celebrate it together. But that's not reality. I mean, we've seen this, and, and we know that we don't have an acceptable base load. We need three gigawatts for sure in order to meet our needs. So oftentimes what happens in the world of politics is we deflect and we defer and we kick the can down the road until all of a sudden we have a crisis, and then we say, oh, no, too bad we couldn't have done something sooner. Well, we could do something sooner. We certainly can look at some of these, if you will, plants that are going off-cycle these incumbent generators of energy and say, well, hold on, maybe this isn't the time to decommission them. Maybe we should say, what is our plan to make sure that we are where we need to be? If Governor Walls has a, a, a really convincing, compelling argument that both you and us are saying, that sounds good, have at it, let, let us know what it is. But right now, it seems like we're, we're on a fool's errand, and we're, just, we're moving in a direction that we know isn't going to solve problems, but we keep moving in that direction because it feels good. At some level, when it comes to talking about climate, David, it's no different than any other kind of virtue signaling. We denigrate the value of that conversation. What we need to be talking about is the environment that you and I live in. What can we do to preserve it, extend it? What can we do to get to renewables? What can we do to make certain that people can live their lives without absolutely decimating our economy? Because right now, we have 9.1% inflation. If you look at the graphs, we haven't been here since the late 1970s, early 1980s, and you know what happened then because it ended up getting to 16, 17% interest in order to buy a home. When we get to that point, if we do, there will be no mulligan. There will be no saying, oh, shoot a mile. We blew it. We should have done something earlier. Can I have a redo? No, there's no redo. 
This is critical and it's critical right now. And we're seeing it right in front of us. We are seeing people get four and 5% raises, biggest raises they've had in a long time, and they're not keeping up. And we're sitting there twiddling our thumbs and saying, well, we're gonna run a campaign like Biden ran it in the basement. Get out on here, let's have you folks interrogate us. Let's have the conversation. That's all we're saying. That would be so refreshing. Yeah. Yeah. Let me okay. try to cast that another way if I can then. You've got ways here to focus on making sure we keep our, our baseload generation capacity up. And I guess to be more specific, what ways do you have to keep our carbon emissions capped or getting lower, which I, I assume you think are, are important? I think there we're looking at the uh, hydro turbine, but that's not going to be enough in uh, number six in Grand Falls. But I think that's where the advanced energy storage, that's where we start to use the, de the funds from the RDF. We have to start unleashing our innovative powers of the mind. This is where we need to go in order to make that happen, David. Is That is the area where, where we do indeed, if you will, secure our energy needs as well as pay attention to the world in which we live. Yeah, I was just going to say, I think uh, on, on its very best days on the MISO grid, wind and solar account for 10%, right? So, I mean, that's just, you know, that's just a fact. We don't, I don't think anybody likes that or loves that, but that's, that's just a fact, right? And uh, you talk about climate change, is the climate changing? I, I think yes. Uh, do we know to what extent? No. Do I think the world's going to end in eight, eight years? No, uh, personally. Uh, and I don't think those sort of hyperbolic predictions do do any good to try to make progress uh, in the plan. We do talk about public and private partnerships, and I would say mostly pri you know, let, let private companies come up with uh, with with the innovative new technologies to make fossil fuels better, to develop new forms of uh, of, of renewable energy. I mean, Scott and I, we were, we were blown away a couple weeks ago. We were over at the University of Minnesota Agricultural Department, and uh, I can't remember the name of the plant, but. Uh, that uh, it's actually making jet fuel out of, which you know, airlines are actually interested in the project and are and are it's close. To, I mean, you know, again, that's you know, let let scientists and those people let them do what they do. Um, you know, the whole human race, in particular America, has always ha has a history of uh, finding innovative solutions to problems. And so, uh, you know, and again, and, and I don't think I don't think it was a loaded question. I don't think I think it was an honest question you were asking. I just don't think it. I don't think it behooves uh, anybody, um, you know, to paint one side this way or that way. And uh, you know, honestly, come here and tell you that uh, you know, personally, the environment is very important to me. It's very important. I think it's very important to everybody. And it's one of those things where I think, you know, we can all put down our partisanship a little bit and just and try to find real solutions that we can live with. But on its best day, when wind and solar is accounting for nine or ten percent of the energy on the grid, last weekend I, thought, I think I read it was four. You know. Um, that's, that's, that's not going to do it. You see what's going on in Sri Lanka right now, right? If we want to have an ESG score of 100, we could do it, but then people are going to wait three days for gas and food, and, uh, and, and there's going to be uh, serious, serious riots. So that's not, the, that's not the way to go either. I think Matt makes a really good point when he points to botanicals. I mean, if you look at biofuels, if we allow E15 year-round, I think that's the equivalent of taking 250,000 cars off the freeways. And that number may, I think that's correct. But we, we, we just spent uh, several hours over at the university. And there's no question that when we combine uh, the, the power of the private uh, with some of the academic uh, results of studies in the, in the public sector, there's answers out there. In the same way that biofuels wasn't present in the 1970s to speak of, really came into the 1990s, we've got potential to create plants that literally operate so differently than us in terms of us giving off carbon dioxide and them giving off oxygen. This is an, this is an opportunity. And the only way we're gonna do that is to say, how do we roll up our sleeves and really make this happen? And I just, I just don't see how it happens unless we, we get out there and we start talking about it. Maybe Tim Walls and Scott Jensen end up agreeing on stage and say, hey, that is really a good idea. Let's go do that. But how are we ever going to know? Doesn't it feel to you, David, like we're at a stalemate and everything is so political? Or if I was ever on stage with Peggy Flanagan, but that might not happen. Um, the uh, last thing I was going to say, I read the book, said if, if we outlaw junk mail nationally, that would, that would reduce the carbon footprint equivalent to 12 coal burning power plants. I am all for that, for the positive effect on the environment, and because I despise junk mail. I got so you guys, guys, no, guys to laugh. No political mailers for the Jensen campaign? Uh, not until after we're elected. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, yeah, our jobs are junk. People want those. <laughs> the, next, the next generation energy act, which set the 25 by 25 renewable standards, was signed by Governor Pawlenty back in 07. Uh, that's coming up. It would, would, those goals would be, have to be met in the next term. Was that a good idea? Would you seek to relax that standard? I think it was a good idea. And I, I, I definitely think those goals should be met, and I think they will be. Time for one more. Just the one thing you said about E15. You're saying E15 year-round and, and not E85? Or what are you, what's the... Well, right now, my understanding is that E10 is a standard, and E15 can be sold, I think, for a, a segment of months, but then it comes off. And I think President Biden said that we can do E15 right now in the midst of this crisis. But if we just said E15 year round all the time, that would increase the biofuel contribution and we'd, lose, we'd use less hydrocarbons. So I think that that was where I believe one of the researchers had shared, if we did that, what that would do is it would be the equivalent of removing some 250,000 cars from the, the vehicles. And I don't know uh, from the roads and their emissions, but I'm not sure how long that 250,000 uh, cars would be gone. I, I don't recall that specific uh, data point, but it was an impressive data point. And what it says is that even just a little tweaking. So then it makes me think, well, why did we not have E15 year round to start with? And, th and then we look at, okay, we have conflicting economic things going on with different stakeholders in the industries. And someone's saying, well, you know, w that's not what we want, and that's what we want. And so I think, again, if we don't have those conversations, we get to flush out that information and say, well, what you used to say really shouldn't be very applicable right now because we're not in a place right now uh, where we get to honor your priority. We are in a place where we've got to try to bring gas costs down. This is not a time. I mean, Governor Walls has mentioned this is not a time now. He's, he's backed off of his increase on the gas tax in Minnesota. For a while, I think he was at 20 cents, and he said, well, let's reduce that by 20 percent. So it was down to 16 cents, I think, for a while. And I think now he, he's willing to say, hey, I'm not going to ask for an increased gas tax, uh, at least until after November 8th. Thanks so much for coming. Appreciate it.